I am Daniel Lucas and welcome to book 101 review and today I have a special guest she is the author of several books and of course a poetry and in celebration for poetry month this coming April well my guest no other than Miss Safa Barnell Hello everybody, how are you doing this fine, albeit slightly groggy day? I hope everyone's having a fantastic weekend and I hope you are ready to enjoy some amazing talk about poetry. I am the cyberpunk and mythpunk based author of Usurper Kings, which is my poetry collection. I've also got Neon Laban, my cyberpunk novel, Charmed Ash and Son of Abel, books one and two of the Judge of Mystic Saga, and Macabre and Monstrous. There are, of course, other short stories and things on the way. Uh, short stories have been published last year and a few years before, uh, but those are my main ones. And it feels great to go back to poetry today because that's the first thing I ever published and I'm so proud of it. So... Oh. <laughs> yes, poetry, poetry, people. So, Miss Bernal, what inspires you to write a poetry? I think <clears throat> my inspiration to go with poetry was based on a couple of things. One, I grew up listening to epic poems. You know, my grandfather was a big lover of epic poetry. So I was this little kid sitting on his knee, listening to him speak Beowulf in, you know, in the old Norse, because of course, you know, he's Norwegian. And so he was trying to keep it alive. He was like, I'm going to keep this alive if I have to repeat this to a seven-year-old. But I loved it. That kind of beat your shield, rhythmic, epic poem about a very brutal, but very honorable man. You know, Beowulf is the hero, but he's also this force of nature until the end. Um, I wouldn't say spoilers on something that's more than a thousand years old. So, you know, Beowulf does end up being an old man dying because he fights a dragon in the end. Um, but he defeats the dragon, you know, and passes things on. And it's just those stories gripped me. You know, the Iliad gripped me. Um, Virgil's Aeneid gripped me. All of these things really held me firm. You know, Keats um, going into more modern poetry too with Margaret Atwood and Christopher Levinson. And I fell in love with poetry. And while I was in university, I happened to have some excellent professors who also loved poetry, including one uh, just an incredible, incredible professor. She really instilled down how to condense a really big idea into something that can be disseminated through poetry and taught of the heteroglossic nature of poetry that you can have all of these different layers, you know, all of these massive amounts of meanings that you can break down from very few and sometimes very simple words. You know, if people understand the context, then it's like, boom you know your world explodes in a good way not in the apocalyptic way <laughs> but, <Yes>. uh, <laughs> sometimes sometimes poetry makes you feel that way though <laughs> yes especially if you internalize it so miss bernal how do you overcome writer's block when crafting a poem i go back to the themes and the subject of the poem itself and i think what textures what images? What sensations am I trying to get across? So usually a poem for me is a search for meaning. It is about something. And I know that is the case for a lot of poets. There is some poetry that's been coming out, you know, in recent times, which is not necessarily a search for meaning, but is its own form of psychoanalysis or it's sort of uh, grip on self-love and different things. And, you know, you do get the poems like William Carlos Williams' Red Wheelbarrow, where it's just about a wheelbarrow beside some chickens. And that's totally fine. That sort of modern push is totally fine. Mm. But for me personally, it's a search for meaning. And so I stop what I'm doing. I take a step back and I go, all five senses. What are they? What does this mean? You know, when I'm writing a poem about, say, 
an orange, then what is it? You know, as somebody who loves food and things like that, what is an orange? You know, and you can like hold it in your hand and it's a little bit rough on uh, the skin and you can kind of like break the skin a little and, and all of a sudden the oils from the orange peel and the smell will just start like wafting around that beautiful citrus scent and then what does that citrus scent make you think of and the sunshine that's necessary to grow it maybe it reminds me of the oranges that we would eat all the time when i was doing work in west africa <laughs> where they're green they're not orange <laughs> you know they're green going into a little bit of like yellow and things like that and they're mottled and they almost look like they're unripe but when you break them open they're just beautiful so like i try and go back to those images I'm trying to represent and what they mean, but I'm trying to think of, okay, okay, what does it smell like? What does it sound like when you, you know, pull the peel off? What does it sound like when you separate out all of those sections of an orange? What does it, what does it taste like? What does it, you know, what does it represent? And how can you get people in on that very visceral experience in a way that you're not, not necessarily going to have the chance to with pros? Yes. So, Ms. Bernal, do you uh, agree that there's no writer's block if you inspired of what you're doing? I think <clears throat> when it comes to writer's block, I think there are a couple of things. <sighs> if you are a writer who is intending to be a writer professionally, then there is a certain amount of discipline that needs to come into your work. And this is not always going to be a fix all for everything. But when you're training yourself over a period of time, you know, taking months and months to train yourself and then years to train yourself to write every day, to get back into that mindset, to find your way back into that mindset, then writer's block is a little bit more elusive of a neighbor. It's still going to knock on your door once in a while, but it's not going to have nearly the amount of times in a week where it keeps knocking for a cup of sugar or, hey, do you want to go for coffee? Um, I think, too, for me personally, I have multiple projects. So when I kind of stall out on one project, I flip gears to another one of my projects. You know, this is why I have two novel series that I'm working on right now, the Lieben Cycle and the Judge of Mystic Saga. And I'll flip gears and then work out something there. And then once I've been like, okay, I worked something out, I accomplished something, let's go back and tackle that thing that kind of scared me or that stopped me from, you know, finishing it for some reason. And so one hand discipline, because this is, an art, but it's also the craft of writing. And you can improve how you conduct yourself in a craft. You know, just with art, you can learn, you could spend more time to learn how to do proper brush strokes. This is especially important in something like Rosmeling, which is a, a Norse folk art that I do. And I started out by just painting giant C's and giant S's on the page four hours because <laughs> grandfather was like no you got to get your strokes down i'm like oh. perfectly but, but you know you can build that part of yourself so that when those moments of indecision come you're able to kind of one you could try and motor through and two if that doesn't work then you can take that step back get yourself a cup of tea or coffee or whatever beverage that you prefer and look at what you're doing why are you stopping yourself from continuing forward? Is it because this is uncomfortable for you? Is it because this is a scene that's fairly difficult? Is it because of indecision? You don't know where the scene is going to go. Do you need to go back and outline it? Do you need to go back and see what is needed? Do you need to go back and read something that you wrote before to connect those dots like pearls on a necklace? You know, is it a lot of the time what I see when I am mentoring authors is that their writer's block moments are actually moments of personal discomfort that they're not willing to necessarily share. And I don't want them to share anything that's too personal. So that's totally fine. But once they understand, oh, 
I don't want to write this scene because it reminds me of something that happened two years ago. And I didn't realize that was still bothering me. And somehow subconsciously, I wrote it into my book. Great. Do you need this scene? <laughs> Can we remove it? Can you move on to something else? No, I'm going to write it. Okay. Sit down, knuckle down, put on whatever music or whatever silence that helps you. If you're somebody that usually listens to music while you work, try turning the music off and work in silence. Mm, yes. If you're somebody who works with silence, try finding a piece of music, usually instrumental. Because I find that if you start adding a whole bunch of words to the music, although I do, you know, my playlists are full of music with actual lyrics in them. But if you're struggling with a scene and then you put something on the lyrics, a lot of the time, some of those lyrics will kind of bleed through. Um, so find something instrumental, take a minute mm -hmm. and then get back on that horse. Oh yes, definitely. Do you follow specific poetic forms or do you prefer free verse and why? I, uh, again, this is going to be one of those circumstances where you're going to be like, Sava, <laughs> I do both. <laughs> I actually have both in Usurper Kings, which is my poetry collection that was published in uh, 2014. So it's 10th anniversary edition is live right now in paperback, digital and hardcover. And uh, it's a beautiful, well, Kevin Hogan said it was a work of jaw droppingly beautiful discovery. So that made me very, very excited about that. Uh, I have sonnets both sort of Shakespearean sonnets and other forms of sonnet. I have um, epic poems in a skaldic style. I have poetry that corresponds with different meters and uh, different structures from history. And then I also have free verse as well. So I find for me, again, this is another thing, maybe it was because I was trained by people who stood on the bedrock of people that came before. And because of my love for the classics, in order to free verse, I have to know what the structure used to be. You know, it's sort of that uh, idea from T.S. Eliot of, you know, you can be a futurist once you know what happened in the past. Yes. But how can you be a futurist <laughs> if you don't know what foundation you're standing on? How do you subvert what you don't know? And so I love researching into ancient poetry, everything from the Epic of Gilgamesh to about 50 years after Shakespeare. Those are my jam. I absolutely love kind of getting into those sorts of poetry, especially skaldic poetry. And skaldic poetry has a lot more alliterative rules and also just different conventions that are totally mind breaking in the English language, you know, it's like, oh, this works better in Norse uh, and Germanic languages, which English kind of is, but you know, English is the language that sort of stole everybody else's lunch money and then put it all together and bought yogurt. Um, and by researching all of those old forms and kind of experimenting with those, it's almost, it reminds me of playing piano and those endless scales and arpeggios that all of us, you know, piano students had to learn, you know, all of the Hannon, you know, where you're da -da 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 the JS Bach, well, well tempered clavier, uh, da -da 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 -da, you know, doing all of that. And then eventually, once you've gotten those in your mind and your fingers and your muscles, once they are part of you, then you can start doing some jazz. Hmm. You can figure out where that dissonant chord is and how to progress from that dissonance into something else, into something sweeter. And then that melody, that standard melody that you've been kind of enraptured with for so long, it's got a little bit of suspicion. It's got a little bit of, you know, sustained drama. You know, it's got that discord in it. It's got that subversion. And then in the end, usually it rectifies itself once again. And so I'm a very, very big proponent of the idea that if you want to do free verse in poetry, absolutely go for it. You need to know where poetry started, though. Yes, it go for it. Work. Yes, it people. Work do. Yes, go for it, people. So, Miss Purnell, how does your personal background influence your poetry? I think more than any other form of written word, poetry is very personal. And it's more 
almost overtly personal because a lot of people write poems about themselves yes. or about emotion or about something that's happened in their lives. And yes, people write memoir and people write, you know, biographies and things like that. But when it comes to poetry, we are tapping into the spirit, the emotion of a person. We are tapping into the subconscious and the creativity that just sort of meshes from the well within. And so it is almost, I would say almost, because there's always going to be people who are like, actually, this one wasn't, you know, but almost always personal. Like I think of the poetry collection Dearly by Margaret Atwood, Mm. which has a lot of poems as uh, it says on the back, you know, even these are the late poems. Most poems are late, of course, too late, like a letter sent by a sailor that arrives after he's drowned. You know, this was something released after her partner's death and it feels like grieving, but it also feels like the catharsis you get from a good cry. You know, it is that, moment in time that you're able to kind of tackle some of these emotions and some of these things that are so big. A lot of us spend our entire lives trying to tackle them. And then it brings them to a place where we can actually attach for a moment and then close that off and, and put it away. And so I believe that poetry is both personal for the writer, it's personal for the poet, but it also creates a window, you know, into the reader's own personal ideals and griefs and joys and exhilarations and boredoms and everything else and gives the reader the chance. It frees the reader to feel things in a much different and more visceral way. It almost, it's almost like poetry gives them permission to be personal for a few minutes. At least good poetry for me does. <laughs> yes. Indeed. Very well said, Miss Safa. But before we go on, I want to shout out my ranking tops in the last 30 days because in Pakistan, I got number 8 on the Apple chart. Bhutan at number 10, United Arab Emirates at 16, Taiwan at 42, Jamaica 56, Cameroon 76, Thailand at 97, and a lot more. Thank you so much. For supporting this podcast because this podcast is created to empower writers all over the world like miss sava burnell so miss burnell who are your favorite poets and how Ooh. they are influence your writing so we talked a little earlier about <clears throat> beowulf we talked a little earlier just a bit about virgil and homer uh, I think my favorite po poets that have been alive <laughs> in the last <laughs> few hundred years, uh, definitely Margaret Atwood. <clears throat> I love her poetry. And that was actually my introduction into the work of Margaret Atwood. It was through her poetry in, I believe, a English 11 class. Uh, so, you know, long standing there. <clears throat> I also absolutely love the work of Christopher Levinson. Mm -hmm. Christopher Levinson is a Vancouver based author who was born in Europe and had an incredible, incredible life. Um, and uh, the last one that I have here that's actually signed um, by Christopher Levinson is a tattered coat upon a stick. Um, and he is very passionately visceral. And I love that. And it gets a little political in some places, but his voice is so strong and so clear. It just radiates outward in a very powerful way. And I love that. So um, definitely Christopher Levinson, uh, absolutely go find some of his pick them up. Another one that I actually quite, quite enjoyed uh, was George McWhorter. Um, this is the incorrection. <clears throat> and so George McWhorter uh, was the Vancouver Poet Laureate for us wow. uh, for an amount of time. And I love... Uh, I was at the, uh, oh my goodness, one of the Vancouver Literary Festivals and he was there and, you know, we were talking poetry and things like that. And, and he signed this, you know, <clears throat> and it was hilarious because he was like, oh, yes. So the incorrection, um, pardon me, my dear, I just have to correct something. And he <laughs> went through his book and he found something incorrect 
mm. in the incorrection. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. And he edited it right then and there. He's like, nope, this is happening. I was like, okay, that's great. I love that. You know, he was a lot of fun. Uh, Sherry D. Wilson is also a fantastically emotional and emotion emotive poet. And so I've got an example of her work right here uh, with the book of sensations. I really like how she kind of twists the everyday and the mythical in um in the book of sensations that really does it for me i love that you know so this was a fantastic uh, fantastic book <clears throat> just for sheer like story value when it comes to poetry mm -hmm. i love emily or suliak uh throwing the diamond hitch mm -hmm. this is um it's a little different than everything else because it's basically a story of her family member back in the day who basically rode through British Columbia with her friend on a horse. <laughs> wow. And so it's a little bit more rip roaring, like it's a little bit kind of cowboy, <clears throat> but just these two ladies going, I don't care if it's, you know, what is it, the 1950s or the 1940s? We're going to ride from, you know, up north to Vancouver on a horse. Like, okay, <laughs> that, all right, go, you do you. Um, now, this one I love because of his translation work. And this is, you can see by the, like, the, the, the dog eared nature of this book, how much I've gone through it. This is Seamus Haney's Beowulf. Um, Seamus Haney did an excellent job, in my opinion, translating Beowulf, you know, and I love this edition too, because as with all translations of poetry, I love it when the original language is on one side and the translation is on the other. Mm. That is what I prefer. I see that too with the work of um, Hermann um, Hesse, the German, uh, no, not the, his, not the 1940s guy. <laughs> And there's, a, there's a poet <laughs> from Germany who wrote Siddhartha, which is an incredible novel to read, and also wrote poetry uh, predating the whole thing. Just I have to say, just because the last name is similar, it doesn't mean yes. that there's a connection. Um, but I love reading translations of good poetry, and I love having the original language on the other side. And of course, I say original language. Uh, now, we know Beowulf was an oral poem. It was an oral tradition before it was ever written down. And it was written down by people who were um, celebrating Christianity, shall we say. And so they were looking at certain things through a very specific lens. But it remains one of the best works of poetry in the world. And Seamus Haney did, in my opinion, the best job of bringing it to life for modern English readers. I, I absolutely love it. I have incredible amounts of notes that are on in this thing. Uh, I have written papers on this for years. I love it. So I would say that those are a few of my favorites. A couple more modern guys that are publishing poetry right now. Um, Peter Grarp Vestergaard of Warning Light Calling. He does fantastic work. He's a Danish poet. He writes in Danish and in English. And uh, he wrote Danish Nordvest and um, Warning Light Calling. And Danish Nordvest is actually in a dialect of Danish that is dying. <laughs> <laughs> and so I love uh, what he's doing to kind of keep that dialect alive. Um, and also Dr. Brad Hogue. And uh, Dr. Brad Hogue, his most recent work was um, The Drake Equation, and it's science fiction mm. and aliens Just and like natural living. phenomenon. Yeah. <laughs> and poetry. It's it's wonderful. So The Drake Equation and Warning Light Calling are definitely two of my current favorites. So Ooh. shout out to them. Yes. Well said, Miss Burnell. But before we go on, I'm inviting you to listen to my other podcast movie 101 review. And on my fourth season too, please do listen to my latest episode. I interviewed one of the executive producer of Hope Studios because they are producing one of a kind movie called The Hopeful by Kyle Portbury, award winning 
or Emmy Award winning director. So please do listen. Movie 101 on my fourth season too. So Miss Bernal, what themes do you find yourself returning to in your poetry? <clears throat> I... I love returning to... I mean, this is going to be no surprise. You and I have talked enough to know that I'm probably going to say this. I love returning to old myths. So myths from kind of the beginning of them and then taking another look and taking another look and kind of putting on more modern and more modern and more modern lenses on those different stories. So in uh, Usurper Kings, there's a couple of poems. Uh, one of them is uh, Le Diadem du Ciel, uh, Reine du Ciel, so the basically the crown of the Queen of Heaven. And then another one is um, Minerva, Athena. And those two poems were basically looks at the figures of Hera and Athena from an outside perspective, looking at the idea of this goddess named Hera right as Christianity was taking over. Mm -hmm. And with um, Athena, with the, the Minerva poem, it was how views of her have changed, you know, going all the way from potential proto Athena, as we're seeing in certain snake goddesses, you know, taken from the Minoan soil, all the way through. And then what do you do with this figure? What do you do with this character? What does it mean to womanhood? And what does it mean to the past? When you have, you know, Zeus's quote, unquote, kind of like, most lauded daughter, you know, his favorite child, who was born out of his own head, um, but happens to be a female, but she's a female that maintains her virginity. Oh. So, you know, she separated herself from that sensual play that you get with a fi figure like Hera, who's protecting married women. And just like getting into the way that those stories have changed. I love that. I love looking like Usurper King starts off with a mindset, almost like the hunter gatherer mindset. Like it starts off with a few creation poems and then it goes into that sort of ancient hunter gatherer, sort of the start of civilization poems and then goes kind of up and up and up and up to the future by the end of the collection. And being able to look at the same concept, you know, human connection work, looking at the concept of, you know, food and the future, how we're going to keep our past alive when, you know, everything's uploaded to some form of uh, computational cloud, you know, being able to look at how all of these concepts that form humanity so closely survive. They, they do. They survive. There are so many links. And you look at poetry going way back. You're like, oh, yeah, here we go. There are so many themes that still maintain their presence for thousands of years. Well, how does that happen? <laughs> what, what, is it something within us? Is it something intrinsic to the human being? You know, is it something intrinsic to our creative subconscious? Is it just something that's part of our DNA? Or is it something that we only consider that way because of certain cultural standards? I love living inside that space and taking a look at what we now as modern postmodern people can preserve from the past, but also can look at realistically from what we know now and kind of, okay, maybe they said that Zeus had fun thunderbolts because they didn't know how to explain the weather, you know, <laughs> <laughs> maybe, you know, maybe they had to say that there was a God underneath the mountain because they didn't know how to explain an earthquake Yes, or maybe the goddess of love is necessary because we all love yeah. and we need somebody to blame for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the nature of people to blame yeah. others. <laughs> so Ms. Bernal, how do you approach editing and revising your poem? Uh, number one, I read it aloud. I absolutely read it out loud. 
uh, which at times when you're working in a public place like a coffee shop or a library can be a little bit odd. <laughs> <laughs> Just a shout out to those people that work in wonderful public libraries that we have here in Canada um, or say a coffee shop and all of a sudden you start a rousing rendition of Beowulf, people will start looking at you funny. Uh, <laughs> Uh, just say it's for a project. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, sorry. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> the first thing I do, I read it aloud. I see if it has flow. I see if it has a rhythm. Even if this is not meant to be read aloud and it's meant to just live on the page, it still has to flow in people's minds. And more than prose, Poetry has to be like water going down a riverbank with a bunch of pebbles of varying size. So you've got to get that flow and the gurgle and everything else that you've got going on, those waves of motion. You've got to have that motion. Um, number two, after I look at the flow and see, does the rhythm work? Do I need to change some words here and there? Do I need to kind of restructure something? I look at figures of speech. I look at imagery and symbol. Uh, are my symbols strong? <laughs> Are they as strong as they could be? Is this just a stepping stone to a different symbol that would work better? Um, another thing I look at too is the, the tone, like the mood of the poem. Is this something that is meant to sadden someone to bring them into a cathartic place? Or is it something meant to give them joy? Do I feel joyful reading this poem? Do I feel anything or is this the seventh time I've gone through it and I'm numb? In which case I put the poem away for two weeks. I don't look at it. I don't think about it. And then I come back to it after a couple of weeks with fresher eyes. <laughs> um, and sometimes that's necessary, you know, with any poetry or manuscript at all. If you're in the revision stages, put it down. Let it go for a couple of weeks and then look at it again later. Um, another thing I, I like to do is... I like to kind of, okay, I'll be honest, read it to anybody in my life who will listen, uh, which is astoundingly less people than other kinds of literature. <laughs> you know, it's poetry. It's not everyone's thing. Uh, but I try and think of who my target audience is. And with poetry, you can be more experimental. You can be more cerebral. That's kind of the area poetry lives in for a lot of people. Uh, yes, you can have poetry about simple things. There's no saying you can't. But the people who tend to purchase poetry, the people who tend to read a lot of it, usually are people who want to get into something a little bit more experimental, a little bit more risky, a little bit more um, cerebral in nature. They want to unpack something. So you can kind of gauge, you know, is this too surface level? Have I gone deep enough? Things like that. Read it to somebody. Read it to somebody who, you know, is just sitting on the couch beside you, like my my poor spouse listening to all of my poems. <laughs> uh, and, you know, very educated person, you know, PhD, the whole thing. And then every once in a while, it's like, yeah, um, so I understood half of that. Oh, okay. So maybe I need to pull back a little on certain things. Maybe I need to change a few words. What was confusing? Like, let's go through this. Okay. Well, um, what does this mean? Oh yeah. That's a word from the 1700s I put in. He's like, no, <laughs> no, um, no. <laughs> I'm like, okay. I'll take out the word from the 1700s and I'll put in its English common language equivalent, you know, um, read it to somebody, see what they think and don't be offended. If they get something completely different or if they don't get it or, you know, that kind of thing, because poetry kind of skims the line of cerebral and discoverable and completely out of luck. <laughs> you know, uh, it can be discoverable. People can find a way in. There have to be contextual clues in the poem itself in order to guide people toward a meaning that you want them to have, unless you just want them to choose their own meaning and then, you know, throw spaghetti at the wall. Um, <laughs> but it can become impenetrable if too many of your sort of contextual cues are too niche and too abrupt 
Or, well, obviously, I was making an allusion to the 16th century poet, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, I put in a little bit of Anne Bradstreet. And, you know, clearly, if you've read the classics, if you've read these following 17 books, then you'll understand this poem. Well, that is going to have a niche audience of probably less than 10 people. You, sh mm. you sure about that? <laughs> yes. Yeah. You're going to put that in a, in a newsletter for those 10 people because then it'll be awesome. But um, you sure about that? Sure. <laughs> for sure, Ms. <Ms>. Bernal. <laughs> I talked to myself here, too, because yeah. I had to do that quite a bit. I was like, okay, maybe I should uh, edit that a little bit. <laughs> oh. And you, that, that's a great inspiration when you're writing poetry. So at the end, Miss Bernal, can we read some of your favorite poems? But before oh. that, I want to please people, uh, please download one of my audiobooks, people. One of the bestsellers audiobook available in Audible. Of course, your book 101 Review Volume 3 suggestions. Earth Fever, my climate change book, Unraveling Climate, and our race to restore balance. Of course, my book 101 Review, Volume 2 Selected, and book 101 Review, Volume 1, highly recommended. This is all uh, my first season episodes, people. Book Volume 1, Volume 2, and Volume 3, and of course, my self-help book, Threads of Existence, Weaving of N. Life is too short. A journey of discovery, fulfillment, and joy. Available on Audible, people. And please do download them and listen and enjoy. So, Miss Purnell, can we have the reading of your well, favorite poetry? Oh, all right. From mine or from somebody else's? Uh, it's up to you. Okay, first thing I'm going to do is start <clears throat> with a small portion of Beowulf. Yes. Uh, I love it here. So again, blah, 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 blah. for those of you who are uh, listening and can see us, then I just waggle the book in your face. Uh, for those of you who cannot see us, I just waggle the book in your face. <laughs> <laughs> so this is from Seamus Haney's Beowulf. And it is a part of the book where Rothgar the thane you know the ruler of the danes where they are uh who has been losing warriors to grendel the monster grendel for so long finally beowulf comes and he's like i am here to solve your problems i will defeat grendel i will take this monster away from you so you can survive uh, all of this is going on. There has been a little minor hubbub where one guy who's really jealous is all like, you're not that great. And, and everyone else around him is like, dude, do you know who that is? It's fucking Beowulf. <laughs> pardon my, pardon my French. Um, <clears throat> pardon know, like, French. Eh? <laughs> like, uh, literally Beowulf, um, later on in the uh, poetry work, Beowulf rips Grendel's arm off and beats the monster to death with his own arm oh my god <laughs> so like beowulf is metal like it's incredible you know beowulf is this raw powerful warrior who understands that as a raw powerful warrior he has this power that is uncontainable in a way and he can be aggressive he can go to places that are almost monstrous but he also has the honor and chival like chivalry is a bit of a later concept, but he also has the honor and the courage and the tenderness of being within a society where everybody needs to take care of each other. So it's this interplay between the warrior who is this vicious, incredible strong man and this man who's looking at an aging king who's lost too many warriors. And I just love how human it is. Like, um, oh, flower of warriors, beware that trap. Choose, dear Beowulf, the better part, eternal reward. Do not give way to pride. For a brief while your strength is in bloom, but it fades quickly. And soon there will follow illness or the sword to lay you low, or a sudden fire or surge of water or jabbing blade or javelin from the air or repellent age. 
Your piercing eye will dim and darken, and death will arrive, dear warrior, to sweep you away. Just so I ruled the Ring Danes country for fifty years, defended them in wartime with spear and sword against constant assaults by many tribes. I came to believe my enemies had faded from the face of the earth. Still, what happened was a hard reversal from bliss to grief. Grendel struck after lying in wait. He laid waste to the land, and from that moment my mind was in dread of his um, depredations. So I praise God in his heavenly glory that I lived to behold this head dripping blood and that after such harrowing, I can look upon it in triumph at last. Take your place then with pride and pleasure and move to the feast. Tomorrow morning, our treasure will be shared and showered upon you. I just like, ugh. this is Beowulf after he has slain Grendel. You know, this is Beowulf who's at his most powerful and he has this this man being like, okay, hi, you miss me. Yeah, 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 you know, grab yourself a drink. Like, obviously we're going to party. It's going to be okay. Like, we're going to have fun, but don't be a prideful idiot. <laughs> you have this power now. You will not always have this power. You have to live your life knowing that you will not always be as strong as you were in your 20s. You know, I love that. I love it's so human. And it's something that was thousands of years old. And yet it's so human. I love it. Like, oh, we can't forget that. Um, I've got a short one from uh, my poetry collection, uh, Limne Electrique. So this is a poem that is, you know, a little more than halfway through the collection. And uh, here we go. How is celluloid different from digital movement of light and fluctuant waves dancing comme les ballerins pour le roi? Le chanson, ma petite le chanson. Collective of noise, pleasant or dystopic, plays the vibration like a djembe in Accra's autumn. Resonations, the latest phase for hipsters seeking nuance and old theater seats dusted with popcorn. Play on, the song, my sweet, my sweet, in electric infamy, play on. Embroil the hip and the wave functions in a battle no stopwatch can measure, lest it come from Grandpa's day, wound a click a minute in musical timidity and repeated performances, identical through celluloid or digital flack track for all ages. I miss the crackle of the gramophone, but I dig this sound. And so this one for me was more of I was in the middle of doing some recording in a studio uh, for some different musical projects and things. And we were kind of debating between like making a record and MP3s, which are sort of like the JPEGs of the audio world. You know, they kind of <laughs> compress sound. You lose a lot of, of those tones and that richness. Meanwhile, you could have like a digital flak track, which is a little bit closer to the way that it would have been if you'd had analog sound. But how is it? The same and how is it different and what do we do with it now like people aren't sitting around an old-timey radio waiting for their show to come on they're not necessarily like i have a record player but uh, you know they're not necessarily listening to their music through a record player where you actually have to take time and care and precision as you put it down and then you need to make sure that your needle is okay and you need to kind of make everything work and watch out whether or not it skips and it's it's this more visceral experience than just clicking play on the beloved Spotify. Uh, no shade on Spotify. I listen to it a lot. <laughs> yes. But, listen and watch. <laughs> and I listen to Book 101 Review on Thank Spotify. You. It's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Because they are supporting our videos. I think yeah. also Player FM, where mm -hmm. podcasts and video art goes together. Excellent. So, Miss Bernal Lande, let's read lots of poetry. Oh, I'd love to. I've got stacks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't threaten me with a good time. I have got many. My desk, you cannot see it. My desk is covered in just piles of poetry books. Uh <laughs> Thank God, people, that I found Miss Safa Bernal as my legit residence guest on Book 101 Review. <laughs> and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much. So, Miss Bernal, can you please invite our listeners to support all your books? Hello, everybody. Again, my name is Safa Bernal. That's S-A-P-H-A. 
B-U-R-N-E-L-L. -L. And you can visit me at SafaBurnell.com and see where all of my books are sold. Basically, anywhere you go that has a greater distribution can bring my books in for you. Uh, and if you're somebody that's like, yeah, I would love to read all your books. I'd love to read Neon Leapin and Usurper Kings and Char Nash and all of those books. But, you know, money's a little tight. If you are in Canada, the United States, or a country that has an excellent library system, please do go to your local public library and ask for them to bring it in. Uh, the local public libraries are amazing resources, and I'm so proud of Canada and other countries that have good library systems for everything they do to not only support readers in their countries and in their local municipalities, but also support authors. So that is definitely a way to go about things. Uh, you can read my books in in digital and in paperback and hardcover, uh, basically anywhere in the world. Yes, all over the world, worldwide, people. Yes, Miss Bernal saying that libraries in Canada are so great because all the books that I featured on Book One One I borrowed in three libraries, <laughs> especially in yes, Vancouver Public Library, mm -hmm. which specifically and. Calgary, and here at um, uh, Maple Ridge. So, Miss Burnell, thank you for your time. And thank you for yours. I hope you and everyone else has a fantastic day, fantastic week, and gets to read some really cool poetry. Yes, tune in next week, people. Yeah. We're gonna read lots of poetry. More to come, people. See you soon.